We come to prayer with me this morning. Gracious loving God, as we thank you for this day that you have provided in our lives, we thank you that you provide that each and every day and allow us to continue our gratitude to those who are in our lives and even more so the ones that we may or may not know. Allow us this day, gracious God, to praise and honor you this morning as we continue to keep our vision and our mission growing alive and strong and as we strive to keep the generosity in our midst. Allow us to come together with one another and through the love that you provide to each of us. So I ask now that you touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day and the words that come from my mouth along with the meditations on each and every one of our hearts. May they ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. So, growing up as a kid, I always looked forward to this weekend, or more so, looked forward to Halloween, because it was a symbol that you got to dress up with some fabulous costume, along with going out and going trick-or-treating and getting all that candy. And I can remember whenever my mother would take us to the store on Halloween to get our costumes, I would always gravitate to the superhero costumes and always wanted to get the Batman costume. Sadly and somehow my mother always persuaded or talked me into something different like a pirate or a clown or whatever, but she just did. However, that one particular year, proved something different. And she let me get the Batman costume. Now to my surprise, that particular year, mom gave in and said, okay. So I went as Batman that Halloween. Now, I don't know if any one of you are aware of this, but there are Batman costumes galore for infants, for children big and small, for men and women, or even for our four-legged friends. But at the same time, when recently peering through the costumes when I was at Target the other day, um, there was no particular costume found on the rack, and I'm sure you might be shocked, for one particular person. And that costume was for Mr. Pennyworth. And by the looks on your faces, everyone's going, who in the heck is Mr. Pennyworth? Well, many, Mr. Pennyworth, for those of you who don't know, was the name, Alfred's last name, the butler in Batman. And you know, Alfred's last name was Pennyworth, but he was the loyal and trusty butler to <coughs> Batman and Bruce Wayne. Along with all of his other stuff, he was the confidant, the friend, he served tirelessly, he even conceived all of that, but you could argue that without Batman, you, excuse me, without Alfred, you probably wouldn't have Batman. Now, Alfred over the years had taken care of the Dark Knight and kept him going. And so if Alfred Pennyworth is so special, then why are there no costumes for him available at the stores along with the rest of the superheroes? And I'm sure probably because everybody wants Batman or somebody else, and nobody wants Alfred. Everybody wants to be the superhero, but nobody wants to be the servant. Anyway, as we bring our DNA sermon series to a close this morning, we've been looking at what our church has been made of. We're looking at that third component that makes up that element of what our church is, what our church mission is. And a lot of it is that we serve others. And what is clear throughout Scripture, if we go through it, that God calls all people to be servants and not superheroes. And of course, in a culture where everybody wants to be Batman and not Alfred, that God calls the people to pursue service and not status. We see through our faith embraced of the truth at and the life of the words of Jesus and through his ministry and particularly that we see in Mark's gospel a lot of that taking place. A little back history on, on this morning's gospel lesson is that Jesus is talking with his disciples 
And it's this critical moment where there is some frustration within the tribe because there are few of the disciples who have these maneuvers or have been trying to plot and plan to have that special place of honor which has pretty much turned out to irk the rest of the disciples. We have them jockeying for position and status amongst Jesus' inner circle of friends and with all of that essentially they want to become that superhero. And of course nobody wants to be the servants as which Jesus just took that opportunity to share with them. But those words are more instructional for them, but they're also instructional for us now in this day and age. And as we heard at the beginning of that gospel lesson this morning, we see as Jesus walked the earth and while he was building God's empire, when he was preparing for the future of the church, he established a new way of thinking a new way of behavior when we are to follow. And unlike the rest of the world, <coughs> that it was fixed on, upon a preoccupied status, along with power and authority, that Jesus called his disciples to servanthood. I think the awesome thing about Jesus is that he doesn't ask or call his followers to do things <coughs> that he wouldn't do himself. He wouldn't just call the disciples and to embrace the positions while he elevated himself at the same time. Being the son of God, even though it was very clear that it didn't come with rules and regulations, but at the same time, even though he deserved all of that, he didn't come to, to be served, but he came to serve others ultimately as he gave up his life for each and every one of us. So that's pretty simple why serving others, at least in my opinion, is one of the core goals in the mission as a church. As we're going to discuss how we're going to cultivate that through the heart for serving others and what it looks like to pursue service rather than status. Now, before we get into all that, I'm going to maybe a little recap of what we've gone over the last five weeks just to bring everybody back to speed as we've established uh, the core of what makes our DNA. What makes us, us? And we do that through our vision and through that mission as a church and of course all the uniqueness of who we are as people that God has brought together, especially during the particular season in the life of the church. And we as uniquely individuals grab all of those and move forward in our vision, we still need to know what makes us, us. When we started five weeks ago, we were reminded that our vision as a church is where the bottom line points to that we are out to develop lifelong followers of Jesus, and that is all about that relationship that we have with God and Christ. And as we do that, we do that embracing those three components that we established that makes up the four points of our mission, which are loving the lost, making those disciples out into the world, and now serving others. A few weeks ago, we talked about loving the lost, where we were challenged to consider in taking part in our next steps. And those next steps as we follow Jesus was we are to help someone else. But to help someone else in helping them take their first step towards Christ. And along with that measure, I share that we need to develop a culture where we are challenging everybody with that one question of who's your one? Who's your one person in your life that you are praying for? That you're having conversations with, that you're committed into doing everything that is in your power to help them take that next step. The one because it's the one that mandates of all we have. That's a calling that we have been given, but we should also at least have that one person that we are prayerfully working with and for just as Jesus has done with everybody. <clears throat> and last week we talked about what it was like to make disciples. And again, we were challenged with the need to recognize 
that we're not just called to be disciples of Christ, but to make disciples of Christ. And while our faith is very personal to us, it has to be our decision to follow Jesus and to be that disciple. And it's very personal, as we said, but we also said that yet our faith is not private. Because when all is said and done, that real disciples make disciples. So as we sort of wrap things up this morning, we're going to focus on that final component of what makes our mission our mission while we are serving others. We've already heard from Jesus' words this morning in Mark, but that we came to be served, and he came, he came to not be served, but to serve. And while calling his people to do the same thing, that if we're going to be those lifelong followers of Jesus, that we need to serve others. And some of those characteristics in serving others, it starts with the way we think. The way we think, the mindset that we have, as it all relates to serving others, becomes pretty significant. It becomes instrumental whether we're going to have the heart of Jesus and think about serving the way Jesus served. Which of these two statements resonates with you this morning when it comes to serving others? I choose to serve, or I choose to be a servant. And being the smart people that we are, I can hopefully conclude that we come to that significant difference between uh, the difference between the two. I choose to serve, and if that's your attitude on that, then you're mentally thinking that there's a pattern that you served that you serve based on opportunity. When there's an opportunity to serve and saying I'm available if I'm interested or if I can make it fit in, but I'll just choose to serve how how I can squeeze it into my schedule. And the only problem with that is that it becomes time-based. It's a situational thing and it's limited. And it primarily becomes that result of trying to fit things into our schedule, schedules yet again. But then there's the flip side. I choose to be a servant. And that's not opportunity-based, but rather it's identity-based. It's a mindset that says, this is who I am. I choose to be a good servant, and because I am a good servant, I serve. And I think it's pretty clear that of the latter of the two of those options to say that we're thinking about serving others is what Scripture is telling us to do. Because serving others shouldn't simply be a response to an opportunity, but rather it should be the results of our identity. Paul actually talks about this more detail as we heard in the book of Philippians this morning in, that, in our epistle lesson. And if you took note, while the lesson was being read, we need to take note that Paul many times talks about why and the way that we should believe. And that we need to make note that Paul describes that it's a mindset that we're supposed to have being followers of Christ. Some of that this morning, and I'm just going to read, read some of it back just to refresh our memory. It says, in our life, in Christ means anything to you. If love or the spirit that we have in common or any tenderness or sympathy can persuade you at all, then we are to be united in our convictions and united in our love with a common purpose and a common mind. Now, of course, Paul was writing to the people of Philippi, but his words are instrumental for any church, for any group desirably deciding to follow the ways of Jesus. Paul begins his essential letter by saying, if you belong to Christ, then you should be on the same page. If there's any fellowship in your gathering, then we need to work together. 
with one mind and it starts that way as we think. And what is most important is that we are on that same page, that we are of the same mind, and that one purpose when it comes to being a vision and a mission and putting all that together to create the vision and the mission of our church. It's important that we know where we're going and where we've been called to go along with our purpose that it's not just being here and having church attendance. It's not all of that. It's not what we believe being the right stuff, but that we're following the right person. Paul continues in the epistle lesson this morning by saying that there must be no competition amongst you, no conceit, but everybody is to be humble, that we are to value ourselves and each of us thinking of the interests of the others that are before us. We need to take note that Paul isn't really talking about taking an opportunity. Rather, he's taking, excuse me, rather he's talking about embracing that identity. This is why it doesn't work for people of God to want to change their way about serving others. Otherwise, if we did that, we'd find ourselves in a position that we would serve possibly out of pity or even obligation. And Paul's telling us, no, that we're not to do that, but we're to think differently when we serve others, that we need to serve being humble. And we need to serve having that identity so it doesn't become an opportunity issue. Paul's also telling us that if we need to think like Jesus, we don't just need to behave like Jesus, but we need to think like Jesus at the same time so we embrace that identity the way we're supposed to. See, Jesus didn't accept an opportunity to serve, but rather he embraced the opportunity to be a servant, which is exactly what we're being called to do and to serve. The second part of all this is that serving others is a matter of good stewardship. And maybe when you're thinking of serving that you aren't connected or you don't correlate it with stewardship, but the truth is, is that we have that biblical view when we see what's around us through that lens and that foundation of the reality that we understand that everything that we are and everything that we have essentially comes from God. We have to understand that if it comes from God then we're expected to use it. We're expected to use it as it glorifies God in the return but we're also expected to do it as good stewards so that we have God's blessing upon us. Now, I know right away when you hear the word stewardship, it goes to the dollar signs. But that's not the, the definition that Paul's using as being good stewards. It's that combination of being good stewards of, your, of not only your treasures, but your time and your talent that goes with it. And that final truth of all of that is that in, to serving others that it requires sacrifice. Serving others is the way that God calls us, but it usually is done with a cost. So when we embrace an identity rather than just choosing it or accepting that opportunity to be a part of it, or that willingness, that it's a willingness that we are sacrificing for the sake of others. And that sacrifice, again, may be of our time. It may be of our treasures. It may even be a sacrifice of our comfort zone or our convenience. It may cost us our plans or it might even need to be something that is sacrificed as we sacrifice our dreams of those things that God puts in our lives. But serving others the way Jesus requires it demands real sacrifice. And it was because that Jesus embraced that identity rather than just accepting it as an opportunity that we need to say that whenever we do that, we need to keep that, keep that mindset that we're doing it because we're sacrificing as he did. I have to say that each week when we take communion, we look upon that as a reflection. 
And as we do that, as we take communion, it's that reflection of our sacrifice or the sacrifices that Christ gave for each and every one of us. Some of the final accounts of Jesus' life is heard in Luke. And it says that amongst all of us that we will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank. And the leaders should be like a servant. And who is more important? The one who sits at the table is the one is the one who is to serve. The one who sits at the table, of course, but not in the here and now. And it says, For I among you are the one who serves. So sort of as a reminder that it wasn't an identity, but it was an opportunity that Jesus embraced, that he embraced that it led him to that very death. So as we bring this series to a close and identifying what our DNA is, what makes us, us, we need to take those moments and reflect. Reflect on all of the different aspects of our mission. All the different aspects of our vision. And as you come to communion this morning, I challenge you to take a moment as you're going through communion to reflect on those things. Reflect on your own willingness to serve the way Christ had called each and every one of us to serve. Have you embraced that identity that Christ has called us for? Are you committed to serve just like Christ served, but being that service, servant throughout all of it? Being that service as we make that sacrifice, all for the glory of God. I bring blessings upon each and every one of you this morning. Amen. Amen.